Hi, welcome. Thank you so much for coming by. Thank you, Gary, wherever you are. Um, aloha. <laughs> well, he's not even from Hawaii. I don't know why he keeps saying that. He's identifiable. You know that. Mickey needs no introduction, of course. He's the circus boy who made good. Yeah. Um, he was first, he was in the Beatles first, and then he was in the Ruddles after that. <laughs> he went to a band in Make in America called the Monkees, the TV show. I know when I was a kid and I was a Beatles fan and the Beatles got all psychedelic and I went, I don't know about this, I'm just a kid, I don't know about psychedelia, I don't know about all this stuff. The Monkees kind of brought it back home for me and I was so amazed, all these great songs sprung up out of a TV group. I think I know the answer to why that happened, but let me ask Mickey, why did that happen? Well, uh, let me just make it clear, <clears throat> the Monkees was not a, a group. It was not a band, it was a TV show about a band. An imaginary band lived in this uh, beach house in Malibu. And um, it was about a band that wanted to be the Beatles. Uh, but we never made it on the television show. We were always struggling for the success. And that, I think, is one of the the themes of the show that endeared it to so many so many kids around the world because um, who were all struggling and in their basements and garages and and living rooms playing and trying to trying to make it and that's what the monkeys was about we never did make it on the television show it was always that struggle which does beg the question of how we could afford a Malibu beach house <laughs> When we never got any work. <laughs> um, but that was what it was about. It was a TV show about this, this group. Uh, then, of course, when we hit the road, we started doing uh, concerts uh, in front of thousands and thousands of people. Uh, Nesmith, I thought, put it well. He said, uh, that's when Pinocchio became a real little boy because we had been hired for all those talents. You had to be able to sing, play an instrument. Uh, I played guitar. My audition piece is Johnny Be Good, which many of you probably know. And uh, we, you had to sing, play an instrument, act, uh, improvise, and you know, well, what else? Whatever the producers were, were looking for at the time. Uh, as far as the music, I mean, I always give credit and, and will again to the incredible songwriters that we have, because that's where it starts. It starts with, with the bass material, the songs. And uh, when you have people like Boyce and Hart, Tommy Boyce and Bobby Hart, Neil Diamond, Carol King and Jerry Goffin, Neil Sadaka, Carol Bayer Sager, David Gates, Paul Williams, Harry Nielsen, uh, all these people writing songs for you, it's hard to screw them up. <laughs> it, it also led to uh, what I thought was, even then as a kid, it was a delicious irony that these guys were living in this beach house and scrambling around to make a living while the songs were at the top of the charts. One, two, three, four. All these monkey songs were hits, and yet the dichotomy. The irony of the band living in the beach house. Why can't, why are they having all these hits? Why are they still in the beach house? That is one of the, yeah, that's a very good point. And that, excuse me, that's a very good point. And that's what I mean. There was the monkeys in the beach house on the show. We'll call that monkeys point one. Yeah, one zero. Monkeys point one oh. Uh, like windows, you know. And um, the monkeys on tour Sorry. and the hit records was Monkey 2.0. Uh, two different kind of groups in a way. The, the, the group on the television show never made it and practiced and practiced and practiced. The group on uh, tour did make it, obviously. 
and uh, played everything, you know, all ourselves. And we'd only met a few months before. Um, we'd all had musical and acting, well, uh, musical backgrounds. Uh, Davy and Mike had not had much acting backgrounds, but David Jones and I, I mean, Peter and Mike had not had acting backgrounds, but Davy and I had. And uh, uh, so the act that was on the road was, was quite different from the act that was on television. Did it create any, shall we say, cognitive dissonance for you guys being part of both outfits? Not now. I mean, not then. No. But now. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, a, a good term, too. Um, cognitive dissonance. Um, not at the time, because uh, for me, and I can only speak for myself, um, uh, it, it uh, I was just doing a job, yeah. and um, th they told me where to show up. I got a call sheet every day, and uh, it said seven o'clock makeup and uh, eight o'clock wardrobe, or, and, and then uh, nine o'clock at night go to uh, RCA Victor and record a couple of songs and go home and sleep and get up at six. You know, it was, it was uh, very intense. Uh, for a few years there. When you first signed on to be on the TV show, were there any real rock and roll dreams in your head? Or was this a TV show? Well, it, that's, a, that's a tough question because I grew up in a showbiz family. And I kind of followed in my mother and father's footsteps. They were both actors, singers. My mom, uh, as a kid, had a... Uh, radio show in Texas singing and my dad was you know in movies and setting in musicals and uh, and I, so I really didn't know anything else and I had my first series at at 10 Circus Boy which some of you may remember um, and but I never had that kind of um, uh, we never grew up in the Beverly Hills Hollywood kind of uh, vibe we lived on ranches kind of down-to-earth uh, childhood. And, but I never had that kind of burning, typical kind of desire, like, I want to be a star and sing on Broadway. I never had anything like that. I, I, that was my father's business. And if he'd have been, I don't know, a surgeon. I might have ended up being being a surgeon, which is very typical. You follow in your parents' footsteps. So no, I never had that. After, um, but I did Circus Boy, and after that, my parents wisely sent me back to uh, public school. They said, "Get him out of the business, you know, because that's the dangerous time for a child star. It is not during the success, but after." Why don't they love me anymore? Why am I not famous you know, at 14 years old? So that's the, that's the time when it starts to go south. So they took me out of school, I mean, out of uh, the business, and went right back to school, and I was just another kid on the block uh, until after high school when I decided I better try to get a life <laughs> and try to figure out what I was going to do. And I decided to be an architect, which I think some of you may know, because I made it public. And I went to school to be an architect. And that was the first time that I made that, that kind of choice that you're, you're referring to um, uh, about a career and a life. But I was singing in cover bands. I was doing little acting gigs on the side. But my plan became. I was going to be an architect, and if I couldn't make it as an architect, I could always fall back on show business. <laughs> not, not, a, not an unwise thing to do, to have different career paths, one that could take you one way, you know, one that had maybe more some short success and another was kind of high in the sky. Um, how did you win the audition for the monkey? So a lot of people who auditioned, we know that, right? What made you the best? You'd have to ask. 
you have to ask the producers that that cast me. <laughs> I don't know. They never told me. <clears throat> they just my agent called up one day and said, uh, "You got the pilot." Because uh, first there's a pilot to a television show, and most pilots don't sell. So I didn't even quit school, because I knew the business. I took a few days off, I think it was like 10 days or something, to uh, 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 film the pilot, and I went back to school. Uh, until my agent called and said they picked up the show, and so then I quit school, because it was 26 episodes. In, in a row, um, but I have no idea, um, uh, particularly why me um, or anybody. Uh, you know, you would have had to had to ask them, but uh, of course they're no longer here. Um, but as a producer myself, eventually I started directing and producing television shows and films and things, all kinds of stuff. Um, when I was casting uh, uh, a show, um, you know, there's certain uh, qualities. I mean, besides having basic talents like reading a script and doing lines, and then you're looking for, you know, in your mind's eye as a director producer, you have certain ideas, certain images, maybe certain uh, types, you know, that you're that you're looking for. In the case of the monkeys, my understanding was is they weren't looking for particular identifiable types. They were looking for characters, different characters. Uh, the monkeys was much more like the Marx Brothers than, uh, say, the Beatles or any conventional, traditional group at the time. And actually, it was John Lennon who I first heard say that. The monkeys are like the Marx Brothers. That was much more accurate. Yeah, not derogatory at all, right? Oh, no, it was complimentary. It was, it was complimentary. It was, right. uh, and that's what the monkeys was. It was the Marx Brothers on television singing pop songs. So in answer to your question, the producers were probably looking for very different characters. The camaraderie that we all saw on that TV show was seemed very instantaneous and real. And obviously, yes, things are written, we're aware of that. Uh, but the zaniness and the love and affection and the sparring and all that. Uh, I guess, you know, the outsider asks, how real was that? Was the connection between you all? That was not just unintentional. Uh, when we um, first were first cast and introduced to each other one day, at a wardrobe fitting, I remember it actually. Um, hi, Mike. This is Mickey. Mickey. This is Mike. Peter. This is uh, David. You know. Uh, oh, hi. It, uh, it was at a wardrobe fitting, and um, the the um, the producers started to screen for us uh, other films like the Marx Brothers, and we'd all seen Hard Day's Night and, and Help and all that. Um, but they specifically did not show us, say, uh, Three Stooges movies. Um, and they said, we don't want to go there. Now, the Three Stooges were great. The, sla the slapstick on the No, there was no, no, the, and not that it wasn't slapstick. We did a little bit, no. but, but it was no hitting each other. Yeah, it was right. no insult. There was no insults. There were, there was no, that's what you meant by camaraderie. Yeah. It was one for all, all for one. And it, it was, come on guys, we can, we can do this. So there was none of that kind of, uh, uh, I don't know, what, what you call it. Like, well, like the Three Stooges, right. which again, was really very funny and a, and, and a great show, but very different. I don't remember this. What was the fake origin story? How did you all get together, especially this Navy guy from England? How did they, how did they tell the crowd these four guys came together? Who, oh, I'm sorry? Well, the origin story of the monkeys. The... Was casting. No, 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 I know that. But I mean, what did the audience know? When they watched the monkeys, how did they think the monkeys got together? Well, I don't know. You'd have to ask them. OK. <laughs> I mean, I was, I was wondering, okay, there are three American guys in Davey. Okay, did he just drift in across the ocean? 
No, I have no idea. You, I mean, you'd have to ask the people that saw it what it meant, what, they, what it meant to them, and uh, you know, uh, and it, I think it means probably a little bit something different to uh, to everybody. You know, uh, uh, it was like I say, it was this television show about this this group uh, trying to make it big. Yeah. And saving the world at times, and, and you know, uh, coming the Monkey Man, and and um, you know, and episodes, you know, about some little old lady who couldn't pay her rent, and we go out and raise the money and try to, uh, you know, it was that that kind of thing? It was very cleverly um, written out. It was very cleverly thought out by the producers. There was no. Uh, uh, topical or satirical humor, um, which is one of the reasons why it, it, I think it survived. Um, like, uh, uh, I don't know, I Love Lucy, or yeah, more, more recently, I don't know, maybe, whatever, name a show that has lasted for, for, for decades, uh, usually because it's not satirical, and it isn't topical. And we were never topical. Um, whereas a show, a wonderful show, like Laugh In, say, or Saturday Night Live. Now, um, if you weren't, if you weren't into the news, if you weren't into contemporary, uh, what was going on you know, in the contemporary world, it didn't make any sense. It didn't mean anything. Um, but shows like, well, I, I reference. I Love Lucy, or other ones, you know, shows like that, um, they're not topical. So they have, lo they have legs, as we say in the business. They, they can go on and on, because the humor uh, uh, is universal, and it, and it kind of just lasts and goes on and on. One thing that impressed me about the monkeys, I believe, is that you got a lot of props from other musicians, did you not? Well, eventually, um, uh, different people, uh, some people got it, uh, and some people didn't. And uh, <clears throat> to this day, a lot of people, I mean, it's bizarre. I mean, I'll do an interview with uh, supposedly a well-read, uh, uh, you know, interviewer who has supposedly done his homework or her hum homework, uh, or their researchers have. And they say, so when the group got the television show, what was that? And I'm like, oh, here I go again. Um, and, and there were people that, that didn't get it. There were people that um, resented it because it was so successful, so fast. Yeah. And uh, we had not apparently kind of come up through the ropes. Because like I said before, in those days, and nowadays it's quite common, but in 66, um, all, all groups had grown up together. They were relatives, you know, look at the Beach Boys or the Beatles who were in grammar school. The Cow Oh, the Cow yeah, the Cow I mean, all those groups had, had grown up together or they were in school together or they, were relatives, and, and along comes this this TV show, um, and takes the world by storm, and just you know so, uh, and a lot of people didn't get that March Brothers, but funnily enough, uh, people in England did more than here, in England, uh, right from the beginning, the get go, uh, the English got it, and I think that's because. There were shows preceding the monkeys that were like that. They were company shows. The Goons yeah. was one. Yeah. Uh, Peter Cook, Dudley Moore. There were not the nine o'clock news. There were a lot of shows that were like uh, the monkeys, and being uh, a, a, comp a company, uh, a group. Monty Python. You know, yeah. they were all. The PhDs at Cambridge and Oxford, you know, and then came. So that tradition was quite common in England. Not so much here. 
not not for not for the monkeys. We talked about this last time. We did an interview here, I think, five years ago, uh, and I believe if my notes are correct. You were asked to join Frank Zappa's band at one point. Is that right? <laughs> I was. I left left the room soon. <laughs> one day he called me. He lived down the street. We, you know, bump into him. He was a big fan. He got it. He was on the TV show. He was in the movie because he got the irony and the and the whole Marx Brothers, you know, kind of vibe. Uh, so he was he was a fan. And when he was changing up, I guess his band or something. Uh, early 70s, I guess, maybe, whenever. Yeah, he called me up and says, do you want to be the drummer for the Mothers of Invention? <laughs> I was like, very flattered. Um, and I said, well, well, well Frank, I, 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 oh boy, I don't know if I can cut a gig like that, you know. I, mean, I, I, I only learned to play the drums like, <laughs> Eight months or whatever, <laughs> and uh, but I said, listen, I'll ask my record company. Yeah, well, I was still under contract. Uh, I'll ask my record company if that, if I can get a release and and do it. And they said, no, <laughs> absolutely not. We were still making records and doing stuff. Uh, but I was quite relieved because. <laughs> You listen to some of that Frank Zappa so stuff. Oh, right. You know, and I did okay uh, uh, as a drummer, uh, but I only had to learn the things that I had to learn. Right. right. I didn't have to learn every other song in the world, you know, like as a cover band, to right. say, uh, well, and be a studio cat, and you know, I could read music, which was fortunate because I played guitar as a kid. And um, so I could read music, and, and um, uh, but I had to learn pretty fast. Uh, we all know uh, certainly some of the monkey songs you sang and you're identified on. Um, and I remember you were telling me about one that you had an audition on and didn't get. That I forget who got. Do you remember? Was that a Davy song? Do you remember? There was a fight, a battle between two of you for. Well, there wouldn't have been a fight between oh, no, us. Fight, fight, fight the producers, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, the producers, we often recorded, uh, uh, Mike and, and David and I, mainly David and I, but also Mike and also Peter at times, would record uh, a vocal on the same track. And then somebody else upstairs would decide. Because I, I think the one you may be talking about is, I want to be free. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that's probably it, because there is a version around somewhere that of me singing that, my, my vocal on it. And I was also supposed to sing a little bit me, a little bit you. But I, um, it, that's that whole uh, issue with playing our own music and Don Kirshner and, um, and all that stuff. And um, uh, I, I didn't sing on that, but David did, a uh, great. Great vocal on it too, and uh, great song, Neil Diamond. Is the most uh, vicious monkey song Stepping Stone? Well, I don't know about vicious. <laughs> it's, well, uh, I mean, it's uh, it's pretty uh, garage rock. Yeah. But that's the monkeys were garage band, literally. I mean, it's, uh, <clears throat> and um, but I would say that's one of the the, the kind of the. Um, up tempo hard rock and roll songs, you know. And, um, I'm not sure what else. Well, Michael's Circle Sky was, you know, brilliant. Um, but uh, not many like that. Did you ever hear the Sex Pistols cover? I'm sorry? Did you ever hear the Sex Pistols cover of oh, Stephanie's? Sure. Yeah, of course. You like it? Yeah, yeah, it was great. And, and then uh, Aunt Dent in, in England did a, a version, and I shot the music video. You wouldn't know who they were, Aunt and Dec was a, Couple of guys in England. It was, they were they were big, big act. Uh, well, it's a great song. That's what I'm saying. The, if you got a great song, it's hard to screw it up, <laughs> and you can cover it and do it a, many ways. You know, uh, uh, if it's if you have that core great material, and uh, that was Voice and Heart. You know, wrote most of our biggest hits, and. Um, a lot of people have covered that, yeah. 
I, you, you've done a lot post monkeys, of course, and I want to get into that, but I do want to leave you with one thing. Uh, Peter Tork told me somewhere in the 80s, he was doing a hard rock, heavy metal version of monkey songs with a band. He played at an Austin club called Bun Ratties, a uh, small club, about 150 people there. And he just rocked up the monkey songs. It was great, it was good fun. And I was talking to him afterwards, and my, one of my questions was, uh, what does it feel to be, be like a monkey, or an ex-monkey, all your life? And he just looked at me and said, compared to what? <laughs> That's Peter. <laughs> so I would ask you the same thing. <laughs> what would your answer be to that? Well, well um, I would say, number one, I, I just I feel blessed. Uh, blessed to have been part of it and I I thank the producers and I have thanked them I did thank them when they were alive uh, thank them for casting me in the show uh, it's been a, a hell of a ride <laughs> and uh, it's had its ups and downs um, but it was not the only thing that in, in my case it was not the only thing in my life uh, even at the time I'd had a series as a kid so I kind of knew the ropes a little bit, and when the show went off the air, um, got, uh, got canceled kind of mutually by all of us, I knew, knew what was coming. I kind of expected it, and I was already uh, in, into other things. I had already started directing and producing. I moved to England and was a, a you know, a, a, a pretty uh, major uh, television director and producer for about 15 years and didn't sing at all, didn't play at all, didn't just just directing and, and producing um, right after the monkeys and <clears throat> that was a wise move. You know, that was again a couple of coincidences and good luck and, and I ended up, because I didn't have to then live those years after the monkeys, you know, uh, wondering what was going on right. and stuff like that. Um, but for, on the whole, uh, I just feel blessed. I mean, you know, it's, it's, uh, it brought me here today, let's face it. And um, <laughs> very proud, very proud of that television show. Very proud of the show, and and very proud of the, the the music that I sang and the songs, and the ones that I, you know, wrote and, and played on, and you know, um, but everything has a half life. Well, and, how about when the monkeys got back together as a group, a touring group, recording? Group? In '86, yeah. Uh, well, that was out of the blue. I was in England producing and directing a, a television series. And some promoter came up and said, you want to go back and sing some of those songs again as a little summer reunion. It was supposed to be 12 weeks. lasted three years. <laughs> and uh, uh, it, it was huge. I mean, you know, I, until that time, I didn't realize what an impact it had had, excuse me, on the, uh, on the, the cultural landscape uh, uh, of the United States and England and Japan, Australia. I had no idea because I'd not been exposed to it for 15 years or, or 10 years or something like that. Um, and it was fun. I was just gonna always oh, like, oh, that's cool. I'll do that. I took a hiatus from the shows that I was producing, and um, uh, said, "Oh, it'll be fun." I had three kids, little kids at the time, and um, we said, "Well, that'll be fun. We're playing parks and and amusement parks and uh, you know fairs. Oh, this will be great fun for the kids. It's twelve weeks, and then I'll." come back and go back to work. And uh, three years later, it was still, <laughs> still going on. But I do remember um, thinking that'd be fun uh, to go back and do that and uh, sing those songs if I can remember them. <laughs> but then there was another ride. Which, which one? Well, which one in the 20... Well, from then on, it's really been kind of a 
constant right. ride. Okay. Yeah, it's 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 been a, a bit of a roller coaster ride, but a ride. Did you disappear and come back, or was there you were always sort of there somewhere? Me personally, the monkeys. Well, you, I you, I can only speak for myself, Jim. In these cases, you have to. Well, you would have had to have asked Peter and Mike and David how they felt about it. Well, I know that Mike started a production company, a big one, and it's one of the main reasons why he he didn't come back for the '86 reunion. Um, he could he was in, in charge of you know 30 employees or something like that. Uh, David, you'd have to ask him. Peter, you'd have to ask him. Um, uh, sorry, what was the question? Uh, or just about the continuity of the monkeys in the 21st century. I mean, well, most of that is, with you, you, know, you know, most of that's not up, not to this day, not it, not up to me. It was never up to us. We never owned the name. We never owned the music. We never owned the logo. We never got a cent from the merchandise. Got nothing. For, uh, and uh, that was the original contract. No residuals for the show. But that was, again, that was typical in 1966 for everybody. Um, and so I've never had any control over it. I just wait for somebody to come up to me and make me an offer. <laughs> um, but I've never had any control. I mean, uh, every time we had to use the monkey name and logo, say, on the, to go on the road, we had to pay for it. Were you ever rejected, I mean, when you wanted to do it, uh, by the people who owned the rights? No. No, they, they, they said they, no. Yeah. yeah, no, they, if, as long as we made them uh, uh, a good deal. <laughs> right. <laughs> so. um, Right now, um, since you are the surviving monkey, uh, are you playing out? Do you continue to play out? And how do you? If so, oh yeah, if yeah. So. I just I just did a bunch of shows um, recently, and I got a few more, bunch more coming up. And uh, oh, yeah. and I have uh, uh, two two different kind of shows going out. One is. Uh, kind of uh, an evening with Mickey Dolan's kind of thing. Uh, a little more intimate, uh, tell more stories, so, uh, you know, ramble on a bit. Great videos that I have from my collection, never seen before stuff. Which reminds me, uh, before I go on, I have a book coming out in case anybody's uh, interested. It's a picture book. It's a, a, a big picture book, coffee table book. And, but it does have some stories, it does have text, but mostly it's pictures from my archives uh, that nobody has ever seen before um, that I just kept over the years. And Andrew Sandoval, a name some of you might recognize, has gone, yeah, and gone through all this stuff in storage bins and put together a picture book right from my birth, you know, early days all the way through the uh, through the monkeys. And um, it's called I'm Told I Had a Good Time. <laughs> um, it's coming out in November for anybody who's interested. Um, you go to my website or something and uh, you, you, you can find it. Um, but, uh, sorry, the second part of that question was uh, uh, oh, we're just if yeah, no. I, if you oh, when you were talking about you have two different shows. Oh yeah, two One different one. shows. So the Mickey uh, Dolan evening with Mickey Dolan's is intimate stories, more you know personal kind of stuff. And then I have another show called Mickey Dolan celebrates the monkeys, and that's when I celebrate uh, David, Peter, Mike, the whole. Uh, the whole thing, the whole, you know, gestalt up. A lot of videos of them, uh, and uh, again, a lot of stuff I, I shot that nobody's ever seen. So you have a backing band. Oh, big, 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 big seven pieces. Yeah. Are there any people of note in the band, or? Not really. My sister, of course, Coco. <laughs> <laughs> 
Barbara Dolenz, um, uh, as a vocalist, she, she does uh, vocals uh, and has always sang with me now for decades um, and sang on some of the original monkey stuff too. And um, uh, But a great uh, band uh, of really great musicians, you know. You mentioned the book coming out. I'm told I had a good time. Were you a Hollywood vampire? Yeah. Yeah, I started. Can you tell me a little bit about that. Uh, Alice lived next door to me. Uh, he moved next door so we could hang out, actually. Was <laughs> what he tells me. He, he used to babysit for my daughter. <laughs> I did. I got a photo somewhere. I'm trying to find it to put it in the book. And it's Alice by the pool, his pool. And I. What? Oh, I've, see, I've seen it online uh, uh, sometimes, but I'm trying to find my original uh, little copy of it. Um, and my wife and I, at the time, we lived next door, and I made a little gate in the fence between my house and Alice's, because she loved to go over there to Alice's and hang out with Uncle Alice. And, um, and he, he, record, he would record stuff in my studio, demos for his new albums and stuff. And we started to play golf together. We learned together from my wife's uh, father. Are you as good as he? Oh, please. <laughs> he's, he's scratch. Oh, yeah. he's, uh, he's up to scratch, or at least a three or two or three or something. Yeah, no, he's incredible. Okay. And um, yeah, my daughter, and then my wife and I would say, well, we got to go out shopping. Can you look after Amy? <laughs> and she's like four, three, four, <laughs> years, five years old. And he would uh, babysit for her. Um, so he came to me one day and said, I want to start this softball team. That's what it was. It was a softball team. He always was an athlete. Yeah. yeah. And so it was, uh, and we would, we got a lot of people to join up. Peter was great. Peter was a great softball player. Um, Albert Brooks, the comedian. Um, I'm trying to think of, of who else. So, all kinds of people that would uh, join in. Oh, uh, Mark from the Turtles, uh, Mark Volman, um, anyway, a bunch of people. And we had baseball shirts made. And um, with Hollywood Vampires? With the V on it, it said Hollywood. And we would play charity uh, on the weekend. We'd play uh, charity events. We, we'd uh, play against the fire department or the police department or other radio or record companies, radio stations, and raise money for charity. And um, that's how it started. Then, after the game, we would go to the Rainbow in the Hollywood and, uh, and drink. <laughs> uh, Alice, of course, is quite famously a recovering alcoholic. Did you go down that road? Uh, well, not to that degree. No. Um, I've had my ups and downs, my issues and stuff, but uh, never to that degree. Um, uh, but then again, just when, kind of the end of the 60s, early 70s, uh, when I was running with uh, my best friend, Harry Nielsen, uh, Keith Moon, oh, Mom wow. Cass, um, uh, that's when I left for England. And so I kind of missed that whole thing in the early to mid and late 70s. Lucky you. Yeah, yeah. Well, again, I, I don't know, luck or just fortune or some. My mom said I always had a guardian angel because I would run right up to the edge of the cliff and then something would, <laughs> would pull me back. Have you heard of the Hollywood Vampires Band today? Oh, yeah. Do you, do you like what they do? What? You like what they do? Oh, it's yeah. wonderful. Yeah, yeah. And Johnny's a hell of a guitar player. I know. People, people dump on him, but he is. He's good. I said he wouldn't be playing with Joe Perry if he didn't make the cut, right? right. Oh, yeah. he, he, they're all very good. Yeah, yeah. And I've seen him a few times and went to rehearsals and, and stuff. And well, look, let's open it up to the audience. We've got a little time left. Uh, do, you, do you want to do the mic uh, thing there? I'll let him right in back of you. <coughs> Not on. <laughs> Better? 
Better? Speak up louder. Okay, I'll try to project. <laughs> Um, first of all, this is a real treat. Um, I grew up watching the show in syndication in the 70s, and I had a crush on you in particular. Um, I admired, looking back, I admired the show so much because the humor, uh, it, was, it was so funny, but it was gentle. It was so harmless, it was never mean. I really admire that. Um, there was only one episode that scared me a little bit as a kid. It's the one where um, Peter wants to play the harp, and he makes a deal with the devil, and then Mike acts as uh, kind of a Daniel Webster figure. I'm just wondering, um, was there ever any um, pushback on that, just because the devil made an appearance from any direction or, or other reaction? Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, first of all, it's not uh, uh, what was the writer you mentioned? Um, uh, Daniel Webster. Yeah, it was actually Faust which was long before True. Daniel Webster. It's the Faustian legend. Uh, I don't know when that was, thousands, a thousand, I don't know. Um, yes, there was. Um, uh, I love I loved the episode, uh, uh, the idea of it. And um, what happened was there was a line in the script that I think I was supposed to say that was, Peter, you can't do this you sign this and you sold your soul to the devil and when you die you'll go to hell and the nbc censors at the time said you can't use the word hell at seven o'clock uh, 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 on a monday it, 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 at the time it was absolutely uh, verboten and the producers went back to New York and said, it's Faust, for Christ's sake. <laughs> it's Daniel Webster, for Christ's sake. What are you talking about? You know, it, it, it's like, this is classic literature. But they said, no, you can't use the word hell on television at 7.30 uh, at night. And so in the show, I think it's me, I can't remember now, uh, said when that line comes up, I say, Peter, you, you can't do that because when you die, you'll go to that place we can't say on network television. Uh, musical question, if we could. We all know, you've always acknowledged, the Beatles led the way musically in the 60s. Everybody followed them. You got, stole a march on them, however, when you got a Moog synthesizer at least a year before the Beatles got one and used it to great effect on records like Star Collector. That must have made you feel pretty good about the work you were doing musically in the studio. Oh, yeah. We, but by that time, we had control. Before that, we didn't. Um, as most of you, I'm sure, know the story. Initially, we had absolutely no control over anything. Not the show, not the scripts, not the songs, not the recordings, not the uh, artwork, not nothing. Absolutely nothing until Mike sort of led that palace revolt and we got the right to control. And that's when Headquarters came out, that wonderful album. Um, that was. Again, that was uh, Monkey's point, <laughs> point two oh. Yeah. That was point two oh. But for that, now having said that, I'm very proud of those early albums and the work that I did on them. Um, uh, Monkey's uh, and then the the, the first two. Uh, very, I'm very proud of those songs and um, and the writers and the music and the music and everything. Um, but when we did get control, uh, yeah, then I was, we were all able to kind of uh, spread our wings musically. And um, Headquarters is the first major example. We'd, we'd played on earlier stuff, Mike especially, but not a lot. Peter to, uh, told a story, used to tell the story of going in the studio in the early days and with his bass guitar, because he was the bass player, and he could play bass. <laughs> and he walked in the studio, and they said, what are you doing here? <laughs> it's like, well, what do you mean? Yeah. 
<laughs> so, uh, but that's an old story. Everybody's everybody's heard that. But yeah, I got the Moog synthesizer, and um, uh, yeah, I, I remember uh, it was a very difficult instrument to play. It was it was uh, almost too clever by half, as we say. It was yeah, it, you couldn't you could hardly even tune it to be a piano. Because it had every frequency in the universe available. And you could program this three uh, octave keyboard. That, that whole three octaves could be just one octave. And so you had A440, if you know music, A441, A442, A443, A444, and then B flat, and then B5, A part. You could have every frequency known to, known to the human ear, and every wavelength. Like uh, it's it's a long story, but it was very difficult to play. So I ended up mainly doing. Uh, I did a couple of records with it, but it, it took a while. But one of my fondest memories uh, is when I had a party one night, and uh, John Lennon came over. Did I drop that name? <laughs> And um, he was entranced by it. And um, I set it up. And he spent hours just doing flying saucer sounds. Just <laughs> yes, it was great. It was a lot of fun. We had fun on it. You did well. I'm going to ask a non musical question. It's a real quick one, just because it's kind of a funny thing. Um, Nikki, you were once asked to audition to play the voice of another Mickey, and you didn't get the role. Do you remember that? Oh, that's right. I did, yes. In the early 70s. Yeah, in the early 70s, uh, the, the uh, gentleman that had done the voice for Mickey Mouse, uh, for Disney, had, I, I'm not sure if he passed away or if he retired, uh, but they were looking for a new voice. and. I came in and, and did my audition and came back and did a callback. And my understanding was is it came down to me and uh, somebody else and the other person got the audition. Yeah, but I was I was uh, I was up for it. Did you try your Mickey Mouse? Oh boy, not now. No. I'm hoarse and. Um, what what is the meaning of the word zilch? Like what does zilch mean? Zilch? Yeah. Oh, zilch. Nothing. <laughs> it means uh, zilch. It just it means nothing. It's a, a one of those words, you know. Kabibble bobble, you know, or something. No, it means nothing. I, I have no idea where, who, who heard it or came up with it. No clue. Yeah. No clue. Uh, over here, yes. Thank you. I don't know if you can bring the mic over there. So, um, what was your favorite, most grooviest scene from Head, either to shoot or to watch? Wow, the, uh, a few. Um, I must say, um, me uh, blowing up the Coke machine. <laughs> that was pretty good. Uh, that whole desert sequence. Um, gosh, what else? Um, I don't know. I guess being dandruff and victim of tourist hair. <laughs> that was pretty cool. Meeting in that from a cello was, because I was a huge fan, I had a big crush on her when I was a little kid. Um, uh, there, there's a few scenes there, the um, underwater scenes, I remember, the stuff I shot in, in the Bahamas uh, with Jack Nicholson. Um, that was pretty interesting. Uh, that's a weird movie. You seen it? 
Can you tell me what it's about? I have no idea. To this day, I'm wondering. Back row. Yeah, I got a good question, because I've never seen this on YouTube, and I guess any, any answer I can't hear you. Really I can't hear you. He's got the mic. <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah, um, I'm always on YouTube, and this question, I, you know, the John Christian concert, a long time ago after the, you know, your careers were kind of over, and I remember you being on there, but I never see it on the YouTube or anything, no one ever talks about it. What? I can't. I kind of remember the Don Krishna rock concert. The what? Don Krishna what? rock concert. I, I don't. The Don, Don Krishna rock yes, concert. I can't say it right. yeah. Sorry. I, I I don't remember. Was I on there? Yes, that's what I want to know. I don't think so. Okay, I'm sorry. No, no, I don't think we were on that. Okay. But no, the monkeys was way over by then. Oh, okay. Oh, way over. To show you on there. That's we did a couple of. TV shows, Johnny Cash show, we did The Tonight Show, we did uh, Laugh-In, we did um, okay, a couple you. of others, I, but not, not Don yeah, Christian. Yeah, I, was, I wasn't to show you were on the later on. No, I don't think so. Okay, no. okay thank you so yeah. much. Well, the better we're exciting. Hi. I just want to say we saw you in April with the Mickey Dillon Celebrates the Monkeys tour. And you got me in tears with the tributes to the guys, especially Michael. Anyway, would you like to share an anecdote about the short-lived tour with Jimi Hendrix opening? Uh, well, everybody, <laughs> I think everybody's heard that that story. I mean, how many people have heard the story of Jimi Hendrix opening for the Monkees? <laughs> Why don't you tell her? <laughs> <laughs> What? Um, why do you think you didn't get the role of Bonds, and how would your life have changed had you gotten that role? The question was, uh, what did you say? How? What? Why do you think you didn't get the role of the Bonds? Why didn't? You uh, ask, ask it in the mic there. It's much easier. I heard that you. It was between you and Henry Winkler to get yeah. the role of the Fonz. Yeah. And besides the fact that Henry Winkler is amazing and awesome. Um, well, why? that's the answer to your yeah, question. Yeah, I mean. uh, he was the Fonz. He was. Yeah. And I, I, um, uh, I got the audition. I, w I think it was down to the two of us. He tells the story. We became good friends. He tells the story that he walked in the final audition, and I was sitting there. And he said, oh, crap, I'll never get this. And Mickey Dolan's is here. Yeah. And, uh, but thank God he did. I, I wasn't the Fonz. I mean, I tried. I, I gave a good audition, I guess. But he, he, was, uh, he was the ultimately the Fonz. Do you have a Milwaukee accent? No. <laughs> no, I didn't. I, I, no, and I probably tried. I tried to do some kind of a New York kind of, yeah. you know, East Coast kind of a, an accent thing. but. No, he was he was the Fonz. When my son needs something fixed in the house, I said you could just Fonzie it, just hit it, and yeah. he had no idea what I was talking about. Yeah. And I showed him on YouTube, and he thought it was the coolest thing in the world. So now he's hitting things in the house, trying to get it to start. Yeah, he he was the Fonz. He's a awesome. great one too. And in answer, I didn't finish answering that young, young lady's question. Um, if, for those of you that don't know, Jimi Hendrix was the opening act for the Monkees for a few shows. And um, I'd seen him uh, at Monterey Pop Festival. Uh, I'd actually seen him before that once. But as the experience, I saw him at Monterey. And I said, wow, what a great theatrical act, because it was theatrical. And um, I told the producers, and they told his people. And sure enough, we we're on the, on the road uh, with Jimi Hendrix uh, opening us, and it was uh, wonderful. What, it was a wonderful, very quiet, very uh, shy, uh, uh, quiet kind of guy. Totally unlike his persona on stage. As it so often is. What? As it so often is, we find. Yeah. The wildest people on stage, Alice, for example. But, but Alice is the perfect yeah. example. Yeah. Yeah, scratch golfer. Right. <laughs> he's in quite game. <laughs> yeah, and then gets his head chopped off. <laughs> 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 um, 
He's going to go over to the monkey mobile shortly. One more question in the back there. Sorry, get a person like that. Sorry, She's been back. trying really yeah. hard over there in the red. Yeah. Oh. 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 Yeah. Mickey, can you tell me about the produce paper, the last episode of the monkeys? Is it is produce supposed to represent marijuana? And if so, did screen gems producers know that? And how did it actually get to air on television? I, I, I the Frodus caper, the last episode of the monkeys about the plant, and there was smoke coming out of the. Oh, well, it was um, it was kind of a uh, I guess a, a pushback at television itself, and because um, the eye, the big eye, was uh, representative of the CBS eye. We were on NBC, and um, it you know it was a you know kind of some uh, uh, attempt to, you know, make fun of how the television could take control of people's lives and, you know, their, you know, everything like that. So it was a silly, you know, kind of, you know, attempt to do that. It was a, a just about television taking over everything, which at the time there was only three channels. So it wasn't, I mean, now it's, it's yeah. Ahead of the Here, here's tonight's programming, honey. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, it is time. It's 3.15 and Mickey has two engagements. He's going to be at the last call at the Monkey Mobile at 3.30. You can get yourself there in 15 minutes. And at 4 o'clock, he's at the table. I'm not sure where that is, but I think we can find it. And I think there are photos and autographs and those sort of things to be signed. So you can see him there in one last round for the moment. <laughs>